All right, we are seeing your PowerPoint. Can everybody hear me okay? And does that look like it's in full screen, Chip? We can hear you and that is full screen. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Um, so as Chip mentioned, I'm gonna to talk today about some larval dispersal simulation work that we do to look at snapper grouper larval dispersal and whether or not um, the spawning special management zones are positioned in such a way that they can facilitate recruitment to the populations in the Atlantic. Um, in general, as context, in 2017, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council implemented five spawning special management zones. They're shown in the map on the right, um, and they're offshore South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida, generally on the order of five to 10 square kilometers in size. The explicit goal of these was to increase snapper recruitment recruitment to the populations in the U.S. South Atlantic by protecting spawning areas. So among other restrictions, fishing for all species in the snapper grouper complex is prohibited year round. And these locations were identified and selected largely because they're thought to be important multi-species spawning areas in the Atlantic. Um, one thing that's important to consider for these type of marine protected areas, however, is whether the oceanographic currents in the area facilitate recruitment to the population or whether they might sweep larvae offshore. So to study that, we use simulation modeling that's specifically designed to simulate larval dispersal from these areas, as well as other areas in the Atlantic where we know these species spawn. So that's the work I'll talk about today, and I'm gonna focus on three main questions. First is what are the settlement dynamics of larvae spawned in each SMZ or spawning SMZ? Second, how do the spawning SMZs compare to other spawning areas in the Atlantic? And third, how much of the overall recruitment to the Atlantic comes from each or the total from all five spawning SMZs together? And so today I'm gonna to talk about simulations that focus on these two species, stamp grouper on the left and red snapper on the right. We're currently working on additional simulations to study the same things for black sea bass, red grouper and gag grouper, but today I'll focus on our initial results from scamp and red snapper. So to simulate larval dispersal, we use an open source particle tracking software called the Connectivity Modeling System or CMS. CMS is specifically designed to simulate complex larval dispersal, and it does so by an integrating reproductive ecology, such as the location and timing of spawning with larval behavior, physiology, um, and, and other aspects of larval dynamics. So when the, how large the larvae are, where they're situated in the, lar in the, the, the water column vertically, their pelagic larval duration, what settlement requirements they have, and it takes those biological aspects of spawning behavior and larval behavior and integrates it with the output from hydrodynamic models and then sim simulates larval dispersal from spawning to settlement by moving individual larvae using the estimated ocean currents. Biological aspects of our simulation model today have noted some of the important aspects in this table. So for SCAMP, we're simulating spawning from March through May with a peak in April. For Red Snapper, the simulated spawning season is from April through September. The pelagic larval duration for each species for SCAMP is 33 to 52 days. For Red Snapper, we're simulating pelagic larval duration of 26 to 30 days. And then we've given each species a settlement criteria of less than 30 meters for SCAMP and between 15 and 64 meters for red snapper. So what this means is that we simulate spawning across a range of locations. The ocean currents move those larvae through time and space. And then if that larvae happens to enter an area with, of less than 30 meters for scamp in the pelagic larval duration between 33 and 52 days, then we consider that a successfully settled larvae. If it doesn't enter less than 30 meters in that time window, either keeps moving or dies at the end of the pelagic larval duration. The last thing, or one other important thing to notice, is that we allowed the vertical migration of the particles to 
to change throughout ontogeny. So at early in the pelagic larval duration, we assume one vertical distribution of the simulated larvae, and later we assume another vertical distribution. And all of these, in, these data inputs for the biological model of our simulations are derived from data analysis or literature review. I won't go into all the details of how we arrived at them, but they've been used extensively for larval dispersal simulations for both SCAMP and Red Snapper in the past with a series of sensitivity analyses on all of these aspects. The Red Snapper work has already been published and the SCAMP work is currently in review. Fact that CMS uses, aside from the biological model, is an oceanographic model. And for the simulations that I'll talk about today, we use the regional Navy coastal ocean model, which has 1 30th of a degree horizontal resolution and covers the entire range that we're interested in, the eastern Gulf of Mexico and the waters off the southeast United States. Um, we're using a set of four different years from this ocean output. 2014 and then 2020 through 2022. I'll note that the individual years, um, we're not trying to get an estimate of where larvae end up or disperse in specific years, but rather a general distribution of where particles for each species tend to end up in the general dynamics. So by using a set of years, we can get a good probabilistic representation of the simulation dynamics, or excuse me, of the dispersal dynamics, even though we're not particularly interested in the dynamics of a certain year. So everything I'll talk about today is averaged over all four of those simulation years. And so we'll use this general framework to conduct two simulations for each species. The first, indicated by the map on the left, will simulate spawning only from the spawning SNZs. And so we'll use the biological um, configuration that I described previously for each species to release a large number of simulated larvae from each of the five spawning SNZs. That helps us answer the first question that I described of what are the specific settlement dynamics of the larvae spawned in each location? So how many are likely, how likely are they to settle and where do those settled larvae end up? Second, to look at the other two questions, we need to consider spawning from other locations in the species distribution. So the second simulation we do for each of Red Snapper and SCAMP is simulate spawning from the entire spawning distribution in the Western Gulf, of, or excuse me, the Eastern Gulf of Mexico and U.S. South Atlantic. Um, and that helps us by combining the results of these two simulations, we can consider how the SSMZs compare to other spawning areas in the Atlantic and how much of the total recruitment to the Atlantic comes from the spawning special management zones. Um, and two things to note that you'll see a lot throughout this presentation are this red line I've shown on the map and that is US Highway 1 and it approximates the boundary between the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council jurisdictions. And second, for these maps that have purple and yellow colors, they're generally shown relative to the maximum value. So the brightest yellow squares indicate the, the grid location with the highest spawning for this map in particular. The purple, the deep purple represent very low spawning. And if there's not a color there at all, there was no spawning. So for both of these simulations, we spread larvae out throughout the spawning season according to the spawning season of the species. To estimate that spawning season for SCAMP, we used, we analyzed histological samples from throughout the Gulf of Mexico and US South Atlantic. This map shows the catch location of all the histology samples we analyzed, it's over 5,000. The red indicate spawning females, while the black are all the other histological samples. Um, and we used a binomial generalized additive model or GAM to use that data and predict the probability that a given sample comes from a spawning female. I won't go into all of the details, but the covariates we use in the model include the day of year, the average depth at the catch location, the change in depth at the catch location, the distance to the continental shelf break, the year, and whether or not the fishery or the sample came from a fishery dependent or fishery independent source. So we use that model for both of our simulations to predict the likelihood of scamp spawning 
throughout the year. This map, or excuse me, this figure on the right shows that marginal effective day of year and is the scamp spawning season that we assume throughout our simulations. So the dashed lines represent the endpoints of our spawning season, late February and early June. And within that spawning season, we release more simulated larvae when the model predicts a high probability of spawning. So we release the most particles or the most virtual larvae in April when the model predicts high scamp spawning and fewer part virtual larvae in March or May when the model predicts low probability of scamp spawning. And this is in line with some of the reports in the literature of scamp spawning season. Second, we analyze the scamp spawning distribution by analyzing data from five fishery independent visual surveys. So this map shows the, the locations of the five visual surveys throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the US South Atlantic. Um, they come from five different sources. Four of them um, are video surveys that drop cameras to the sea floor and then count the number of fish of each species that they see. And the, set, the last one in pink in the keys is a diver survey that does the same thing, but with divers instead of video cameras. This is the same map, except the, the locations of the survey are scaled to the size, size dependent on how many scamp were observed. So if a data point went away, there were no scamp. And if a data point got larger, there were a lot of scamp. Um, what you can see is that scamp tend to be on the outer shelf or near the continental shelf in deeper waters. And they seem to be about the highest in the northeast Gulf of Mexico, and then in the Atlantic off the coast of North Carolina. So we also analyze these spatial distribution data with generalized additive models, but we use a two-step delta gamma approach with two submodels. First, using all of the data, we used a binomial model that predicts the probability of scamp presence or absence. And then second, using only those data that observed scamp we used a GAM um, that predicted the abundance when present. It ended up being a Gaussian GAM with a fourth root transformation, but we tried several different error distributions and several different transformations, and this is the one that ended up being the most appropriate. And again, I won't get into too many of the details, but the covariates that we used in this model were all of the variables that overlapped across the five visual surveys, specifically the distance to the continental shelf, the position along the shelf, the average depth at the location, the change in depth. And then we also use several other covariates from the observations to standardize our model. That was the percent substrate observed on the video survey or in the diver survey, the maximum release observed, what survey the data came from, and the year. And so we can calculate using these the three models I've described today, the relative spawning throughout space as the product of the three models I've described above. So the relative spawning at each location is the probability of presence times the abundance when present times the probability of spawning when present. And this is the map that I showed earlier that shows the spatial distribution of scamp spawning throughout the Eastern Gulf of Mexico and US South Atlantic. So these are the key distributions, spawning in time and spawning in space that we use for our larval distribution simulations. On the left, the spawning season is applied to all of our simulations, both that that only releases particles from the SSMZs, and the spatial distribution on the right is only used in the model, in the simulation that releases particles throughout the entire spawning distribution. I won't go over the details for the red snapper models, but I will say, that we use the same types of distributions, a spawning season shown on the left and a spatial distribution shown on the right. And these came from recently published reports using statistical models that predict the spawning time and location for red snapper. The statistical approach was slightly different and the covariates and the data used were slightly different than we used from SCAMP, but these have all been previously published and also used for SCAMP, or excuse me, red snapper larval dispersal simulations that has already been published. So now to get into the results, um, I'll first talk about the first question. For each of these three questions, I'll walk through them one at a time, first for SCAMP, then for Red Snapper, and then present a little summary of our findings. 
The first question is, what are the settlement dynamics of larvae spawned in each spawning special management zone? That is, how likely are they to settle and where do they end up? So as a reminder, these are the spawning special management zones on the left map. And we released a large number of virtual larvae from each of the five locations and spread them out through, through, throughout the scamp spawning season shown on the right. And just a brief reminder for scamp, the pelagic larval duration was 33 to 52 days. Settlement larvae are allowed to settle if they found a location less than 30 meters inside that 33 to 52 day window. And we did let the vertical distribution of larvae change throughout ontogeny. These maps show the results from this Area 51 spawning special management zone. And again, I'll walk through them briefly with this first slide because there are several slides that use the same conventions. On the left, the yellow dot represents the location of the spawning special management zone that we're releasing particles from or virtual larvae from. The lines represent the trajectory for the virtual larvae. If it's a green line, that was a particle that successfully found settlement habitat and the end point is shown in the blue dots. If there's a black line, those are virtual larvae that were swept offshore or for some other reason did not find suitable settlement habitat within the particular settlement window. And they, the end points are shown with a red dot. So, and then on the right, we're seeing the spatial distribution of the successful, successfully settled larvae with relative to the maximum. So these are the locations of the endpoints of larvae that found settlement habitat with the yellow grid locations indicating the place where the most larvae settled. So from Area 51, 84% of the simulated larvae settled. Most of them ended slightly inshore from the spawning SMZ and slightly north off the coast of South Carolina. If we move to the Area 53 spawning special management zone, 72% of the simulated larvae from this location successfully found settlement habitat. And the settlement distribution is similar, inshore and north of the spawning special management zone, um, but a little farther north than for the, the Area 1. Moving to Devil's Hole, only 44% of these larvae settled successfully and the distribution of the recruitment locations is farther north um, with, with settlement locations spanning the North Carolina, South Carolina border, but still relatively inshore. Looking at the South Cape Lookout SMZ, which is off the coast of North Carolina offshore, only 2% of the larvae spawned here settled, settled successfully. You can see from the map on the left that the overwhelming majority of particles, there's a lot of black lines here indicating that most of these particles were swept offshore and did not actually find successful settlement habitat within larval duration we simulated for SCAMP. To the Warsaw Hole spawning SMZ, which is off the coast of the Florida Keys near the Dry Tortugas, 21% um, of these simulated larvae settled in the Gulf of Mexico and 21% settled in the Atlantic, as defined by the red line on the right map, which approximates the boundary between the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic Fishery Management Council's jurisdictions. So it's important to note, however, that even though the, over, the density of particles is highest in the Gulf of Mexico, just north of the SSMZ, the same amount of particles that settled in the Gulf also settled in the Atlantic, they're just much more widely distributed spatially across the entire U.S. South Atlantic. So that, those were the general results for SCAMP. Moving on to the results for Red Snapper from the spawning special management zones. We're releasing part, virtual larvae from the same five locations, but using a different spawning season from April through September, a shorter pelagic larval duration of 26 to 30 days, and the settlement habitat is 15 to 64 meters, so slightly larger range and a little bit deeper than what we simulated for SCAMP. From Area 51, 31% of the particles, the virtual larvae settled, again, mostly inshore and slightly to the north of the spawning special management zone they were released from. From Area 
similar percentage, 34%, about one third of these released simulated larvae found successful settlement habitat. And again, inshore and to the north of the spawning special management zone they were released from. Moving to Devil's Hole, a little farther offshore, again, 34% of larvae found settlement habitat within the pelagic larval duration. And inshore, but closer to the North Carolina, South Carolina border is where most of these larvae tended to settle. South Cape Lookout, offshore in North Carolina, again, just like SCAMP, very few particles simulated from this special management zone actually found successful settlement habitat. Most of them were swept offshore. However, those that did settle ended up near inshore in North Carolina. The Warsaw Hole Special Management Zone in the Florida Keys, similar dynamics to what we saw for SCAMP. 18% settled in the Gulf of Mexico, 15% settled in the Atlantic, and 67% of particles did not settle. And again, the highest density is in the Gulf of Mexico, just north of the spawning special management zone. We released particles, but a similar proportion of the virtual larvae settled in the Atlantic, just in a wider distribution throughout the US South Atlantic coast. Here's a summary slide showing the settlement dynamics from the previous slides for SCAMP and Red Snapper. On the left, I'm showing the spawning special management zones or the release locations as the dots for SCAMP and the shaded areas indicate the density distribution of settlement locations for particles from the spawning special management zone of the same color. So if we look in Warsaw Hole, the release location is in the dot, is the pink dot, and the settlement locations for most of the particles is just above it in those shaded areas. So SCAMP is on the left, Red Snapper is on the right. Very similar um, spatial distributions of where particles or virtual larvae from each spawning special management zone ended up. And the table shows the percent settlement of the virtual larvae simulated from each spawning special management zone. So that's where a lot of the differences come between Red Snapper and SCAMP. For SCAMP, there's a wide range of the percent settlement from each spawning special management zone. Area 51 has relatively high settlement success with 84%, but South Cape Lookout has exceptionally low settlement success with only 2%. Across Red Snapper, most of the, sim the SMZs are around one-third of settlement, except for the South Cape Lookout, which is only 3%. Of successfully or of simulated larvae found settlement habitat in Warsaw Hole is 15%. It's important to note that this table is showing the percent of simulated larvae that settled in the Atlantic jurisdiction. Um, but if we allow particles to settle in either the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic, the Warsaw Hole dynamics in particular change. Um, for SCAMP, the likelihood of settlement increases from 21% to 42%. And for red snapper, it increases from 15% to 33%. So this depends really, are you mostly interested in recruitment to the Atlantic only or recruitment in general? On to our second question, how do the SSMZs compare to other spawning locations in the Atlantic? We'll look at three things. Specifically, how the spawning SMZ, SMZs um, what level of spawning we expect at each location compared to spawning areas throughout the rest of the Atlantic, the likelihood of settlement or the percent settlement released of virtual larvae released at the SSMZs compared to virtual larvae released throughout the spawning distribution, and then the total recruitment that we expect to come from each SSMZ compared to all the other spawning locations in the Atlantic Ocean. Again, I'll walk through these figures on this first time that I'm showing them. Everything from this point on, the grid locations on the left map shows the spawning locations and they're colored by whatever metric I'm talking about. So for this map, we're showing the relative spawning throughout spawning areas in the Atlantic Ocean. The yellow grid indicates the highest spawning, the purple, the lowest spawning. I've plotted the SSMZs as well. On the right, I'm showing the histogram of the relative spawning across the entire Atlantic Ocean. 
Um, so not just at the spawning special management zones, but this shows the distribution of spawning, relative spawning from all spawning locations with the location of the SSMZs plotted in vertical lines. So what we see here is that most of the spawning locations in the Atlantic tend to have about 10% of the maximum spawning. So on the right, a level of one would, would correspond to the grid location on the map that's bright yellow, and about one quarter shown by teal turning to purple is 0.25 on the histogram. And so we see that most of the spawning locations release less than one quarter of the maximum spawning from all spawning locations. The Devil's Hole spawning SMZ. In our table, I'm showing two columns, the percent of relative to the maximum spawning across the spawning distribution. So we see that the Devil's Hole SSMZs releases 38% of the, or has the 38% of the spawning as the maximum spawning location which puts it in the 93rd percentile across all spawning locations. So there's a little bit of a difference between the percent relative to the maximum and where you fall in the distribution. So because this tail is relatively long, um, a location that releases only 38% of particles compared to the maximum spawning location can still be among the top 15 percentile of spawning locations of the distribution as a whole. So I've colored the rows in the table according to that percentile. The top third, so 66th percentile to 100th percentile are green. The middle third of the distribution is in orange and the bottom third of the distribution is in red. So what we see is that area 51 releases or spawns 10% of the spawning output compared to the maximum spawning location and it's about the median of all spawning locations in the Atlantic. So for SCAMP, three of our SSMZs are in the top 15% of spawning locations across the Atlantic Ocean, even though they're still releasing about one third as compared to the maximum spawning location. If we move on to the percent settlement by spawning location, the map on the left shows the likelihood of settlement success of particles released from each grid location. You can see that this is a dis different distribution from spawning. Instead of having a lot of spawning offshore or high densities offshore, the likelihood of settlement is much greater from inshore spawning locations. The yellow is inshore and farther south, whereas spawning we saw more of the yellow offshore near South Carolina. And we can see that the spawning SMZs are relatively well distributed, um, but many of the locations in the Atlantic tend to have high probabilities of settlement if larvae are released there. The combination, um, this shows settlement only in the Atlantic. If we change and let settlement happen in the Gulf as well, we see that the pink line moves closer to the, or farther to the right, indicating representing with the dynamics that I was talking about earlier, where for the Warsaw Hole SSMZ near the Keys, if you only consider settlement to the Atlantic, it doesn't do very well. But if you consider settlement in the Gulf and the Atlantic, it performs a little better. Um, still, however, it's not as high as some of the other locations in the Atlantic, which largely have about 75% of released larvae settle. Um, like we see in the spawning SSMs or SMZs in Area 51 and Area 53, the red line and the greenish brown line. This is the same table, but showing how the SSMZs stack up against the other spawning locations in the Atlantic for percent settlement. Um, and this is what we see. The Area 51 and Area 53 are in the top third of Atlantic spawning locations for SCAMP, um, and they have relatively high percent or probability of settlement when larvae were released there. The other three, however, have relatively low settlement success and are in the bottom third of spawning locations in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, 
the amount of recruitment from a given spawning location really depends on how much spawning occurs there and the proportion of larvae that are spawned there, what proportion actually settle. And that's what this map shows. The, high, the brightest yellow grid location is the spawning area that provides the highest number of recruits to the Atlantic. And the distribution on the right shows how those how the number of recruits coming from different spawning locations is distributed. So we see that the majority of spawning locations provide less than one quarter of the recruitment when compared to the location that provides the total or the maximum amount of recruitment. So when compared to that brightest yellow grid location, most location, spawning locations in the Atlantic are releasing or are providing one quarter of the recruitment or one quarter of the number of recruits. And that's what we see in the table. Area 51 is in the near the median um, and it provides 14% of recruits compared to the maximum spawning location providing the maximum number of recruits. Area 53 and Devil's Hole provide about a third of the recruits when compared to the location that provides the most, but they're in the top 15% of all spawning locations throughout the Atlantic. South Cape Lookout and Warsaw Hole provide relatively little in terms of actual successful recruits to the Atlantic. And this is largely a combination of spawning, but for South Cape Lookout in particular, the fact that very few of the particles released there actually find successful settlement habitat. So this is a summary table for SCAMP showing the SSMZs and for spawning, the percent of larvae settled if released from that location and the total recruits produced. And in the table, I'm showing the quantiles or the percentiles for where these SMZs fall within the distribution of spawning locations in the Atlantic. Area 51 on the top row is about the median in term, when compared to all of the other spawning locations in the Atlantic. However, it's in the top 15% of spawning locations with respect to how likely particles released there are to actually settle. And that puts it slightly above the median in terms of the total relative or the relative amount of recruits it produces to the Atlantic compared to all other locations in the Atlantic. And I think what's interesting to look at in this map is that it really identifies, or in this table, is that really highlights that. A place like South Cape Lookout, which releases, is in the top 15% of spawning areas, provides very little recruitment because it's very low probability of settlement. However, Devil's Hole has a relatively low probability of settlement when particles are released there, but its spawning is exceptionally high, so we still see a large proportion or a large amount of recruitment when compared to other spawning locations. Another way to look at this is to plot every spawning location on a scatter plot. On the figure on the left, I'm showing the probability of settlement or the percent of larvae when released from this, settle, this spawning location, how many actually find successful settlement habitat is on the x-axis and the relative recruits to the Atlantic is on the y-axis. So the highest point Showing one, that's the release location that provided the greatest number of recruits to the Atlantic Ocean in our simulated um, dispersal simulations, and each data point is scaled relative to that. The color of the data point shows the relative spawning output. Again, the brightest yellow, which happens to be the same as the highest level of recruitment, is the spawning location that has the greatest spawning compared to all throughout all of the spawning locations we consider. And so what you see is that even if you go really far to the right on this plot and have very high recruitment success or a high probability of recruitment if a particle is released there, it doesn't necessarily imply that the number of recruits to the Atlantic is high because spawning might be very little. Instead, you areas that produce a lot of recruits are those that tend to be relatively balanced between spawning and the likelihood of settlement if a particle or larva is spawned there. And the red dots indicate where each SSMZ falls within the broader distribution of 
release locations or spawning habitat. Moving to red snapper, this is the map and the distribution for relative spawning. And what we see is that most of the spawning for red snapper in the Atlantic happens in two places, off the coast of Florida near Cape Canaveral and a hot spot near Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. However, the SSNZs are distributed in different locations and they're across the Atlantic, there are very few locations that have the same amount of spawning as those hot spots near Cape Canaveral and Cape Hatteras. So even though the Warsaw Hole spawning SNZ, the pink dot and the pink line is among the top third of spawning locations for red snapper in the Atlantic, it only has 8% of the spawning compared to the maximum spawning location shown by the yellow dot. So there's a very limited area where red snapper spawning is high in the Atlantic and the SSMZs don't tend to, inter or to overlap with that area. If we move on to the percent settlement by spawning location, again, this map shows every spawning location and they're colored by how likely it is a particle or a virtual larvae release there is to find successful settlement habitat. What you can see is that, again, the likelihood of recruitment success is high in off the east coast of Florida, slightly north of Cape Canaveral, and that doesn't tend to be where the spawning SMZs are. However, most of the locations in the Atlantic have about one-third recruits released there, or particles released there actually find settlement habitat, and so several of the SMZs fall right around the median probability of recruitment to the Atlantic when compared to the, the spawning locations throughout the entire Atlantic, even though they're relatively low when we consider them in relative to the highest area of like, likelihood of settlement. And now if we look at the combination, oh, excuse me, again, if we, the last map showed settlement only in the Atlantic, this slide shows settlement anywhere, including the Gulf of Mexico. And what we see is that the Warsaw Hole SSMZ in the Keys moves up because some of the particles released there end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And when we consider Gulf settlement, um, it tends to be right around the median of all spawning locations in the end. The combination of settlement, six, likelihood of settlement and spawning gives us the number of recruits produced from each spawning location. Again, it's colored by the maximum, so the yellow grid location is the area that produces the highest number of recruits to the Atlantic. Um, and again, similar to spawning, there are very few locations, spawning locations throughout the Atlantic that come close to that. Um, but even when considering the distribution of spawning locations in the Atlantic, the SSMZs tend to be in the bottom third, except for the Warsaw Hole, which is around the median. But again, it only produces about 4% of the recruitment when compared to the spawning area that produces the highest level of recruitment. This is how things change if you allow um, settlement in the Gulf. It doesn't change very much for most of the SSMZs. They provide about less than one or 2% of the recruits that the maximum spawning location does or the highest recruit spawning location does. Warsaw Hole goes up in its position in the distribution, but still only provides about 10% of the recruits when compared to the highest or the, the, the spawning location that produces the highest amount of recruits off the east coast of Florida. This is a similar summary table that I showed for SCAMP, showing for red snapper. There's a lot of red and orange on this plot, or this table indicating that um, for spawning, likelihood of settlement and recruits produced, the spawning SMZ, SSMZs don't tend to do very well for red snapper um, and tend to fall either in the middle or bottom third when compared to other locations, spawning locations in the Atlantic Ocean. Again, this is the, the, the same plot showing the probability of settlement on the x-axis by spawning locations and the relative amount of recruits provided to the Atlantic on the y-axis. 
and the SSMZs are shown in red. I didn't highlight their names because the, the letters got jumbled up together because they all tend to provide relatively low recruitment to the Atlantic when compared to other locations in the Atlantic. And there's a cluster of locations off the east coast of Florida that has high probability of settlement and therefore a high probability of spawning, or excuse me, and a high probability of spawning, and therefore produces the majority of recruits to the Atlantic Ocean. So question number two, how do SSMZs compare to other spawning areas in the Atlantic? I'm showing the distribution of where scamp recruits come from on the left. So these are spawning areas colored by how many recruits they provide to the Atlantic. For scamp on the left and red snapper on the right, and then the table in the middle shows each SSMZ, the percent of the maximum recruitment it provides, and the percentile of where it falls in the spawning distribution. So for SCAMP, we see that Area 53 and Devil's Hole are in the top 15% of Atlantic spawning locations for the amount of recruits they provide to the Atlantic. However, they provide about one third of the recruitment when compared to the highest, or the, the spawning area that produces the highest recruitment, shown with the yellow grid cell. But for Red Snapper, all five SSMZs provide less than 5% of the maximum recruitment from the spawning locations off the east coast of Florida. Um, but Warsaw Hole does tend to be around the median of all spawning locations in the Atlantic. Now, this brings us to the third question of how much of the recruitment to the Atlantic comes from the SSMZs. So overall, looking at all recruitment to the Atlantic from anywhere in the spawning distribution, what proportion of that comes from the SSMZs? And I'll talk about three things. First, the expected contribution from the SSMZs as they're currently implemented. And then I'll go through a couple of thought experiments and back of the envelope calculations looking at what would happen, how that contribution would change if they were larger, or if spawning was in particularly concentrated at them. And finally, what if they were placed in the perfect place for each species? And I'll go over what I mean by that in a second. So by just calculating of the total recruitment to the Atlantic Ocean, we can break down where that recruitment comes from, either the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, not in an SSMZ, or the SSMZ. So what we find is that for SCAMP, almost 17% of the recruits to the Atlantic Ocean actually come from the Gulf of Mexico. And this is something that we're tending to find for several species that we do these simulations on, that there's a small but consistent amount of recruitment from the Gulf of Mexico, that end, or spawning in the Gulf of Mexico that provides recruits to the Atlantic Ocean. So for SCAMP, 17% of the Atlantic recruits come from the Gulf of Mexico. Just over 83% come from the Atlantic outside of the SSMZs, and less than 0.05 of a percent come from the spawning special management zones. For Red Snapper, the, the results are similar, with 10% of the Atlantic recruits coming from the Gulf of Mexico, 90% of the recruits in the Atlantic coming from other locations outside of the spawning special management zones and less than 0.01 of a percent come from the spawning special management zones and if we break that, that down even though it is very small numbers we can see that for scamp most of the spawning special management zone recruitment comes from area 53 and devil's hole most of the, the red snapper recruitment among the ssmz's come from comes from warsaw hole followed by Area 53, but again, it's a very small amount when compared to other places in the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. Now, we predict the relative spawning in 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid cells, and these estimates that I'm showing here assume that spawning is uniformly distributed throughout each grid cell and therefore takes into account the footprint or the area that each SSMZ occupies. So I'm showing here that most of the spawning special management zones are between seven and or around seven kilometer square kilometers, with the South Cape Lookout SSMZ being 13 square kilometers is the largest, 
But if you remember, very few of the larvae that are spawned there actually find settlement habitat. If we assume that the SSMZs were larger or that spawning is concentrated, so in other words, if we assume that all of the spawning in a particular grid cell that an SSMZ falls in occurs at that SSMZ, so this might represent a very extreme aggregation where any spawning fish in the area does it within the SSMZ, or alternatively, another way to conceptualize this would be that the five SSMZs were hypothetically expanded to encompass the entire 100 square kilometer area of the grid cell. Um, and so for reference, that would be a total SSMZ area of 500 square kilometers, um, which is 10 times the total area that the SSMZs currently occupy. If we do that, then the SSMZs would account for one half of a percent for the scamp, for scamp, and one tenth of a percent for red snapper. So it increases an order of magnitude based on the current implement, implemented area of SSMZs, but it's still relatively small. On the other hand, if the SSMZs were placed in the perfect location, and by that I mean the spawning location that produces the most recruits to the Atlantic, which is a different location for each species, but as a hypothetical experiment, um, if we place, if we assume the settlement dynamics and the dispersal dynamics, so the likelihood of settlement and the total spawning from the locations that provide the highest recruitment to the Atlantic and apply the current area of the currently implemented SSMZs of 46 square kilometers, then the SSMZs would account for one half, one and a half percent of scamp recruitment to the Atlantic and 3.4% of red snapper recruitment to the Atlantic. And to extend this thought experiment a little farther, if we assume that they were perfectly placed, so they are those, lo those spawning locations that provide the greatest recruitment to the Atlantic for each species, um, and there are 10 hypothetical SSMZs that each occupy 100 square kilometers, then mm -hmm. These hypothetical SSMZs would account for 6.5% of scamp recruitment to the Atlantic and almost 15% of red snapper recruitment to the Atlantic. But again, this is a total area of 1,000 square kilometers, which is 20 times the total area of the current SSMZs. But what we can learn from this type of thought experiment is that the scamp locations for the SSMZs is relatively good for scamp. It could be better and it could benefit from increasing in size, but in particular for red snapper, if they were in a different location that was more optimally placed for spawning and probability of settlement, you would get a more of an increase in the total amount of recruitment to the Atlantic than you would otherwise. Um, so this summarizes kind of that third question of how much do SSMZs contribute to the Atlantic? It's the same table from the previous slide. And the answer is that there's not that much Atlantic recruitment coming from the SSMZs, in part because um, there are settlement or spawning areas that have higher spawning and higher probability of settlement for red snapper in particular, but also because they're relatively small as they're currently. So in conclusion, the current SSMZs account for very little of the total recruitment to the scamp and red snapper populations in the U.S. South Atlantic. Some, but not all, SSMZs are well positioned to protect scamp spawning. So this is the distribution of the amount of recruits, or excuse me, the relative spawning at each spawning location in the Atlantic for scamp. And you can see that three of these SSMZs are in among the top 15% of Atlantic locations. However, the, those areas with high spawning are not always the areas that provide the highest recruitment. Probability of settlement success is recruitment or is critical. And that's, I think, exemplified by the South Cape Lookout SSMZ, which has high probability of spawning or relative spawning for scamp, but most of the simulated larvae are swept offshore and don't actually encounter appropriate settlement habitat. Um, the current SSMZs are not particularly well positioned for red snapper spawning and recruitment. On the left, I'm showing the distribution of red snapper spawning in the Atlantic and most of it occurs off the east coast of Florida or in Cape Hatteras, um, but the SSMZs are in other locations. And on the right is the source of recruits. So the spawning locations colored now by how many recruits 
they provide to the Atlantic, with most of them coming from the east coast of Florida. And again, the SSMZs are in different locations. And then finally, the small footprint of each SSMZ makes it difficult to facilitate meaningful recruitment to the Atlantic as a whole. So even though, even if these were placed in the best place you could imagine where the highest recruitment density comes from, if they're on the magnitude of their current footprint and area, um, it's going to be hard to account for a large proportion of recruitment to the Atlantic. Um, we're conducting similar simulations for GAD grouper, red grouper, and black sea bass because as you know, identifying an SSMZ for many species is particularly difficult. So we hope to have a broader range of species that we can look at these sorts of things for. And it's a balance between finding high spawning, high probability of recruitment success, and doing that for many different species. So um, with that, thank you very much for listening. And there are many people that were involved in this work that weren't listed as co-authors, in particular, a lot of data went into analyzing the spawning distributions and developing the biological framework that we use for um, the dispersal simulations. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. My email is there. Um, and also, I think some of our other co authors are on the line too, if there's a question that I Thanks, Chip. And I'll uh, pass it back to you. All right, thank you. Once again, just going over um, how to operate this webinar. Um, you can enter a question into the question box. You can just type it in there, uh, or you can raise your hand. If your hand is raised, it will turn green. And then um, I, when I unmute you, uh, you'll get noticed by the way and unmuted. Then unmute yourself until the microphone turns green. And with that, I see that Brendan has his hand up. So, Brendan, you've been unmuted. Sweet. Uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me. Roger, um, nice to hear from you. Great presentation. Really interesting. Uh, got several questions, and I, I'm just going to ask one at a time um, to be courteous. The first one is: Can you can you please comment on the decision to uh, look at Red Snapper with this? project given that I'm pretty sure and maybe uh, Chip can confirm that the SSMZs were were primarily uh, designated to protect deepwater species um, from bycatch and bycatch mortality, uh, specifically Warsaw grouper and I think speckled hind were identified. Um, I'm happy to hear from Chip on the goal behind the SSMZ spe for specific species. Um, part of our reasoning for going with Red Snapper is because we've done a fair amount of simulation work with it. So a lot of the biological framework has already been developed. Um, so it's positioned well to start with for this type of analysis. Similarly for SCAMP, um, we certainly do hope to expand and are currently working to get to some of the other species like gag grouper, red grouper, and black sea bass. Um, but I think our, our thought process was just that we'd like to kind of see for a suite of species in the snapper grouper complex, how these SMZs perform and whether there might be other locations that would be better positioned to um, facilitate or protect spawning and facilitate recruitment for some of the other sensitive species. Yeah, and just to build on that, um, red snapper was a, a species that was listed as species for the spawning SMZs. Um, but when these were created, it's not the, nearly the population of red snapper that we do today. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that it, it might not seem like ideal locations for snapper. Any other questions? Brendan? Hey, me again. Uh, just wanted to know, Roger, whether you thought it was an issue that, um, and I'm just coming from a South Atlantic perspective here, an issue that the 
the SURFs and, and CFIS uh, program takes place from roughly May to October, but uh, spawning, at least for um, SCAMP, takes place in a basically a completely different season. I think your plot had February through May. Um, so just wondering about whether there are any potential biases in your results from the, the mismatch uh, in, in those two data streams. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, I will say that when we develop the models to predict spawning, we do so in two steps. We predict the distribution of the species first, and that's what uses the SURFS data and the visual surveys. Um, and it looks at, we, we don't predict the seasonal distribution that changes over, over time. We're looking at the general areas where we tend to see the most scamp um, across the entire sampling window. So every sampling um, date of the visual surveys, and then the spawning season in particular uses histology data um, that are caught some from that program, but also from a lot of other programs as well. Um, although the timing of that sampling does tend to be in the summer as well, we can generate the spawning curves from the relative kind of amount of spawning versus the sampling. And that's what the, the model does. Um, so it would be an issue if we expect a species to move particularly large distances and their spatial distribution to be very different during the spawning season than out. So for a species like GAG, that's probably something that we, we should be considering. Um, but for other species where they don't move great distances, and, and I don't think SCAMP is known to move travel extremely large distances, um, I don't think it will be as much of an issue. All right, uh, Steve Turner has a question. Steve, you're unmuted. Okay, um, I'm wondering, uh, I, I'm sorry I entered the uh, seminar late, so you may have addressed this, but I'm wondering what uh, annual variability in hydrography would have, a, what effect that would have on these results? You're a little muffled, but I think what your question was is the annual variability in the oceanographic estimates or the estimates of ocean velocity at each location. Um, and I, I agree that that does matter greatly. So from one year to the next, the oceanographic models can predict considerably different um, estimates of velocity. And so that's why we look throughout several years. So for this work, I we simulated um, larval dispersal for four different years, um, and then all of the results were shown um, as an average across all four of these years. Sometimes we do look at specific years and kind of how it changes from one year to the next to get an estimate for variability, um, interannual variability, but for something like this, we're mostly interested in the general dynamics around um, how many particles are likely to settle from a given SSMZ and the distribution as a whole. So we're okay with pooling a large number of years to capture that interannual variability. If you actually wanted to predict um, the specific amount of recruitment in a given year or in a future year, you would then certainly need to account and um, consider estimates for that year specifically, and it, it would become a, a, a major component. All right, any other questions or Steve, did that answer your question? Yes, I'm sorry you couldn't hear me very well. All right, Will Heyman has his hand raised. Will, you're unmuted. Showing you're, you're still self-muted. Can you hear me now, Chip? Yes, we can. All right. First of all, thanks. This is a wonderful presentation, fabulous thought uh, experiments and, and simulations, really, really uh, valuable. So thanks very much for 
for the work of this whole team and for the presentation. Um, I, I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I'm, I'm going to limit it to just one here, and that is um, kind of a sensitivity question. Um, you're reporting kind of percentages of recruitments uh, as a single value and then comparing those values um, you know, from sites and from regions, et cetera. So, you know, if you tell me there's 34% of, you know, recruitment that occurs from this site or whatever, I'd love to get a sense of, you know, kind of what the plus or minus what, and, and, and does that, you know, has that been calculated or how, how do you account for the variability uh, between those instead of just the, the absolute values that you get? Um, in the past, we've done some kind of bootstrapping resampling work from the simulation output and calculated those proportions um, within each of the resamples. And so I haven't gotten around to doing that for this specific set of simulations yet, but we will get some confidence intervals from, from that. Um, and then we can also look in the past, we've done um, considerable sensitivity analyses using SCAMP and Red Snapper and changing various biological inputs within the simulation model and changing that very the hydrodynamic model that you use because those things can change some of these dynamics and um, we've looked at those particularly with respect to which ones change the proportion of particles coming from the Gulf to the Atlantic um, but we felt that this was kind of a, a representative biological model and one of the highest resolution of geographic models that expands both of our areas. Um, so I think probably for this, the most the most forthcoming estimates of variability around those percentages would come from some bootstrapping work that I'll that I'll do do soon. Um, and feel free to email me other questions. Chip knows how to get a hold of me as well. Thanks. That's helpful. All right. And Lewis has his hand raised. Lewis, you're unmuted. It's showing yourself muted. You click on the microphone. Hello, how's that? Wonderful. Hey, Roger, great convers uh, great talk there. It's great to hear your voice and see what you've been up to. Uh, just, just a quick short question here. Um, looking at the maps that you presented, it looked like for, um, at least for the Devil's Hole SSMZ, that that kind of yellow patch where, the, where you were predicting um, the highest spawning i guess is what it was in this case was rel looked to be relatively close to where um devil's hole actually lies and i'm wondering it's hard to get scale with some of those maps but i'm wondering kind of just what that approximate distance might be from where devil's hole is to that area that you're predicting as being the kind of best hypothetical spawning um patch in the south atlantic um i'm not sure which map you're thinking about lewis um do you so sorry it is a little hard to answer without a visual plot here do you have oh that's okay that you'd like me to think let's about see. um so it's gonna be So that this is a this is a good example, I think, right? Devil's Hole is the green green dot that looks to, appears to be close to you know a yellow patch of high predicted spawning. Right. Um, so I'm just trying to get a sense of you know how 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 close that really is to to what we're predicting as being a really great area for spawning in this case. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good question. So in for the simulation models, I predict spawning output and therefore the number of um, larvae that we simulate from each location on a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. These maps are um, a slightly coarser than that, just to, for clarity. They're on a one quarter by one quarter degree grid. Um, and so that's about 30 kilometers in a grid cell. So from the devil's hole location that you're talking about right there to that bright, bright yellow point is probably about 30 kilometers. Okay, thanks, that, that really helps just to kind of contextualize this a little bit for me, appreciate it. Yeah, 
I, I think that's why it's important to consider not only, well, there, there are two aspects. One, the proportion of recruits that Devil's Hole, we might, we might expect from Devil's Hole compared to the location that produces the, um, the most recruits, that's one piece of information, but also where that location falls in the distribution. So that's why you see um, Devil's Hole is only producing one third the amount of recruits to the Atlantic that that maximum area does, but it's still in the 85th percentile of all spawning locations. Um, but yeah, it's also important to remember that these are just estimated models and distributions. So it, we might want to take it with a grain of salt that that specific location has the the highest amount and so on and so forth, which is another reason why I kind of expanded the grid a little. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. There was a question written in the question box um, regarding that, that yellow box that Lewis was just talking about. Um, is there a particular feature um, in that yellow box uh, where it's uh, likely to predict that high level of scamp recruitment? I would have to dig in a little bit more. So, um, but one thing that's, in, some things that are important to remember are the, the amount of recruits to the Atlantic from each of these spawning locations. So this map currently isn't showing where the recruits end up, it's showing the spawning areas that produce um, and how many recruits they produce. Um, and so that's a function of how much spawning exists there and also the oceanographic dynamics of where those spawned larvae tend to disperse. So do they go offshore or do they move inshore to, to, towards suitable settlement habitat? So both of those play a role. Um, and then underlying the spawning distribution um, are things like how quickly the bathymetry changes, are you close to the continental shelf and all those sorts of aspects. Um, we haven't done extensive habitat-based modeling um, for these species, but I think anything like this, it just kind of reinforces that if you're gonna place an SSMZ using these sorts of modeled results, it's probably a good idea to go check it out first and confirm that there is in fact pretty good spawning happening and that sort of thing. But I think these do give us a good indication of if if larvae spawn there, are they likely to move inshore or get swept away? And then using our estimated spawning distributions, we can kind of get estimates of relative recruit production. Right. Any other questions? Um, Chip, I do have a, a question for other folks if nobody else has questions for me. Um, I, I think, as you mentioned, these SSMZs are set to sunset in, in a few years, at least some of them. And so as that decision is being made, I guess as a team, we're curious if there's anything that this type of work outside of what I presented today, if there are other types of results or other types of information that a larval dispersal simulation experiment could look at, is there anything that would be particularly helpful or informative throughout that process? Yeah, um, we are having our system management plan work group we're looking at having a meeting in november and they would be looking at uh providing some recommendations to the council in regards to these areas so it, it might be interesting to see some of the questions that they come up with um, based on some of this research as well as some of the the research that will has done in the, uh, the spawning smz's and some of the work funded by the nature conservancy and pew so i i think it's going to be a, a variety of questions that might come up and I'm I, I think you did a great job providing a, a ton of information here um, and and made it easy to synthesize at least for me um, I see Will has his hand up he works in this area quite a bit so he might be able to respond some too go ahead Will thanks Chip and and thanks for uh, turning it around that's a, a nice way to um, 
to do that. So appreciate it. No, so I, I guess another question um, for you has to do with um, how much, it's so hard, these simulations are so hard and there's so many things to parameterize, but I'm, I'm w wondered about the, um, the idea that, you know, you're averaging recruitment across all years um, and, you know, is that consistent with what we're seeing in terms of recruitment dynamics? Is, is that a kind of a linear recruitment on, a, on an annual basis or is it more pulsed, you know, and does that vary by species? Similarly, you know, in terms of the question that was just asked previously, uh, in terms of shelf edge morphology, you know, are there any differences in shelf edge morphology and or, you know, if it's a 10 kilometer square grid cell um, and given the dynamics of some of those small scale dynamics that occur on shelf edges and, and you know, is that, is, is that something that can be taken into account as well? So I, again, this is probably way beyond what's possible, but just, just curious where you're at on some of these questions. Thanks, Will. Um, I, even if something's difficult, it's nice to hear that it would be interesting so we can think about if we can address it. Um, I think we'll definitely, I'll consider with the team kind of other metrics of recruitment. So maybe maximum recruitment or minimum recruitment and those sorts of things and how those change. And we will look at the year to year variability among of each of these kind of proportions um, that we're considering. Um, so that's a great point, and I think we'll consider it. In terms of the, the resolution, in principle, we, we could release particles at finer resolutions at the SSMZs. It's really computationally intensive to release it at a finer resolution across the entire spawning distribution. Um, but I th so we, we could consider doing that for more a select smaller group of locations and see how much um, that influences our estimates from a particular location. But the other thing we run into is the resolution of the hydrodynamic models. Um, so this one is 1 30th of a degree, um, which is pretty darn small for hydrodynamic models, but kind of, they don't all necessarily capture the, the bathymetric complexity that you're referring to. But, um, but yeah, those are kind of some thoughts and I think we should have some similar results from the other species by November. And Chip, we can continue a conversation on as this develops, what, what things might be um, helpful. And if, if people have other things we should consider, um, it'd be great to hear that throughout the process. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was a question written in the question box. Um, could this be used uh, for offshore wind effects of spawning habitat as well as uh, potentially microplastic distribution if surveys for sources are collected? Um, one of our co-authors, Claire Paris, developed the CMS and I know that she's used it to look at kind of dispersal of all sorts of things like oil spills and things like that. So she might be able to talk about um, applying it to other things like microplastic um, distribution and dispersal and things like that. With respect to offshore wind, I know that there's been some work looking at kind of how wind farms change the hydrodynamic dynamics or the oceanographic dynamics locally. And I think there is some influence on a very small local level, but I'm not really positioned to um, talk about that personally. I, it's not really my, I don't know that much, so I don't want to <laughs> say something about something I'm not confident in. But in terms of this specific work, I think um, that would be difficult to kind of assume where the offshore wind farms might be and what effect you might expect them to have within this kind of recruitment simulation context. Um, it's just a, a very difficult thing to, I think, estimate at this point. but. If anybody else on the team or outside has comments on those questions. Anna has her hand raised. Anna, if you unmute yourself by hitting on the microphone. There you go. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, Yes, we can. Uh, hi. hi, my name is Anna Vaz. 
Um, yeah, I, I work with Claire Paris and uh, I'm working um, this office center now um, as Siemens is affiliated. And I can answer part of just the wind uh, question. Yes, we can use uh, CMS to look at dispersal from um, the areas where wind farm are proposed to be done. And we're gonna be doing that in the Gulf of Mexico, looking particularly at red snapper because the species that is shown to aggregate in the areas where the lease was proposed in Gulf of Mexico to aggregating artificial structures. Um, but we could expand to other species. And if um, even in the absence of velocity fields that are taking into account the changes of the circulation because of the wake of, of the wind farm itself, we could do some variability and some sensitive analysis around having higher mixing, how different um, physical components that we can change in the model, like level of diffusivity or turbulence, how this would uh, change um, the dispersal from the farm. So there are several ways we can tackle. We can, we can have um, the development of a model that takes into account the farm, the effect of the, the wind farm into the hydrodynamic itself is, it would be fantastic, but this is, I think is a, a very complex technical um, undertaking and, and you should have resources for that to happen and including collaboration with the, the developer uh, who is, is doing the farm to, to understand how they're gonna do placement of turbines and all that. Um, but there are ways we can, we can work around it and look at um, what is the connectivity, what is the spillover from these areas where the wind farms are proposed and, and if uh, some changes in the circulation could change the, the amount of recruitment. Um, and I think Claire can talk more about the microplastics, but we work in the oil dispersal. And yes, absolutely can be done with microplastics and we can do um, even decay of microplastics and their changes with time. Those things are all possible with CMS. Thank you. Thanks for chiming in, Anna. And Claire has her hand raised as well. Claire, you're unmuted. If you click on the microphone. Oh, yes. there you go. Hi, everyone. Yes, this is Claire Paris. Um, uh, so Anna answered most of the question. And yes, the CMS can uh, simulate microplastic and simulate the uh, wind turbine um, disturbance at the surface. What I want to say is that most of these larvae at the pelagic stages, they're not really near the surface, um, but um, but they would certainly affect their recruitment um, um, because of the, the, the noise that is creating, and this is something that we, uh, I was in a conference in France uh, three weeks ago talking about wind farms. And there's two aspects of it. One is the footprint of the wind farm, um, similar to oil platform, they have a, a, a very large uh, footprint. Um, and the, the, the sound, the, the disturbance from the, the sound of, of the um, motor from the, the wind farm. So, um, the idea is to to set up this, an array of hydrophone and to understand a little bit more how this is affecting uh, not only the larvae themselves, but uh, in terms of transport, but also um, the spawning of the adults. So th there is di different aspect that that can be addressed um, uh, using CMS in combination to visual surveys and, and acoustic surveys as well. But certainly CMS can, can do a great job in looking at differences with uh, wind-driven transport and stoke drift, um, turbulence at the surface and, and other aspects that are also affecting microplastic. I hope that answered the, the question or complement what Anna said. I think so. Um, Joy, if you had any other follow-up. Uh, she, she said thanks uh, to both you and uh, Anna. All right, Brendan has his hand raised. <laughs> 
Thanks, Chip. I know we're getting short on time, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, just to respond to Roger's question for the audience about extensions of this work and what we might be interested in. Uh, I think it would be neat if possible, and, and this is easy for me to say, um, to add a second criterion for uh, settlement habitat, um, and, and namely what sort of substrate is there. Um, and an extension of that would be uh, to try to try to uh, model the ideal locations for the placement of future artificial reefs. Um, and that you could also see an, an offshore wind uh, tie in there. Um, just looking at your, your maps and thinking about the upcoming uh, Carolina Long Bay wind energy area and how if the depth requirements are there uh, for larval sediment of these species or other species, uh, the emplacement of all of that structured habitat might result in um, ideal locations for settlement. Uh, there's not really a question there, but um, that's just an answer to your question. So thank you. Thanks for your comment. Yeah, in, in principle, with these dispersal simulations in CMS, you can specify any sort of settlement habitat. I will say that it's not dynamic within the simulation where the particle says conditionally, am I at this depth, am I at this substrate, but rather in advance of the simulation, you specify um, settlement areas or polygons, and then the simulation says, are you in that area that was pre-specified or not um, to determine settlement? So um, for ours, we just use simple bathymetric kind of filters to say, any area less than 30 meters or between 15 and 64 meters. And it gets into, I think, an interesting discussion on um, settlement requirements because we also know that many of these larval fish can swim and orient themselves towards preferential settlement. So if we're too narrow with our settlement criteria that we specify for the simulation, um, we're ignoring that component. And I know there's also been some development of CMS to incorporate behavior of the, the, the larval particles and simulated larvae, but um, the assumption kind of the way we've done it is that if a scamp larva reaches less than 30 meters, they'll be able to find suitable settlement habitat that they're close to. And Claire has her hand raised, and I think, for this question as well. Oh, it went down. Yeah, that was a mistake, sorry. Okay. Steve, you had a, another question, maybe a, a response to Roger's uh, request. Steve Turner. Uh, no, I, I did uh, have a, a different issue. I suggested uh, considering in the long term uh, what's the what would be the effect of uh, uh, creating SMZs of one percent, five percent, and ten percent of the total South Atlantic management area. So doing a, a broader kind of thought experiment to look at if, if, if SSMZs were protecting certain proportions of the total management area, um, we can certainly do those sorts of analyses in post-processing. Um, some of the questions would be, um, which areas do we pick and, um, and that kind of thing. But we, we can definitely consider um, sensitivity analyses around that sort of question. Well, we are getting close to our time here today. I, I certainly appreci appreciate the great presentation that you gave, Roger. Uh, it was very informative and, and also timely. I think this is gonna be uh, a study that's used by the system management plan work group that is used to evaluate these areas and provide recommendations to the council. And I'm sure the council is gonna be looking at this. Um, this webinar will be posted on our website uh, under the um, seminar series webpage. Uh, so if you have any questions about it or you want to see it again, um, that it'll be available. And then I also wanted to put a plug in for next month's um, seminar series. We're going to be talking about ropeless gear or um, 
I guess, on-demand gear uh, that can be used in the black sea bass pot fishery to avoid North Atlantic right whales. Uh, that one will be on August 8th from 1 to 2.30 as well. So thanks again, Roger, and everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks.